Do you remember when Britain nuked America? Do you remember when they did it the other time? Because I, I do not. So I found this video called When Britain Nuked America Twice. So Mark Felton Productions. I don't know why I'm not subscribed. But speaking of that, sometimes you think you're subscribed to people and you're actually not. Just like that. So go ahead and double check and make sure you're actually subscribed to me if you want to be subscribed to me. If not, don't worry, obviously. But anyways, when Britain nuked, Britain nuked America twice. I don't know anything about this at all. So this is definitely going to be an a interesting video. So let's check it out, guys. In the 1960s, Great Britain nuked the United States not once, but twice. Fortunately for all concerned, the attacks were only training exercises, for so embarrassing were these attacks that they were hidden from the American public for about 50 years. If it was training exercises, why was it embarrassing? Did they accidentally nuke, like, one of our islands or something? Sky's the limit in air battle for U.S., it says. As well as being strenuously denied to the American press for decades. As far as America was concerned, its defenses were 99% effective. But in simulated attacks, Royal Air Force bombers managed to penetrate U.S. airspace to launch nuclear attacks on New York City and several other important urban centers. Before I tell you how, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity okay. Stream, a subscription streaming service created by the founder of the Discovery Channel that offers thousands of documentaries Go check and out the uh, in a month or nineteen ninety nine. Curiosity a year. Stream. And for my audience, the first thirty days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash Mark Felton. There you go. And use the promo code Mark Felton during the sign up process. All right, so it sounds like it was simulated. It wasn't real. And America failed twice? Uh-oh. This is going to be interesting. Curiosity Stream, the best streaming service for lovers of history. It might be. I don't know. I've never How did out. the British manage to penetrate the world's most heavily defended airspace? The answer is surprisingly simple and consists of two words. Avro Vulcan. Is that that airplane? The Vulcan first flew in 1952, the team that created it led by Roy Chadwick, who had designed the famous Lancaster Heavy Bomber of World War II. A jet-powered, tailless, delta-wing, high-altitude strategic bomber, the Vulcan was the backbone of Britain's nuclear airborne deterrent during most of the Cold War, okay. serving from 1956 until retirement in 1984. This is the story of Exercise Sky Shield, when Britain nuked its closest ally, exposing how the Soviet Union could have done the same for real. In 1960, the United States decided to run the largest test of its air defences in history. Okay. Exercise Sky Shield 1 occurred on the 10th of September 1960, and all commercial air traffic over the US and Canada was grounded amounting to a 1,000 U.S. commercial flights and 700 general aviation aircraft, plus a further 31 foreign flights due to land in North America. The US Why would they ground the flights if it was a simulation for an attack? In real-world situations, you wouldn't just have that. It would just, the attack would just happen while you still have all this air traffic, so I don't know. But then again, that kind of makes it more pathetic that they lost twice like the united states against the you know and let the british nuke come in basically because it's like you didn't have nothing else to distract you what happened s strategic air command would launch b-52 strato fortresses and b-47 strato jets to simulate a massive soviet nuclear bomber force approaching north america from north and south 
360 U.S. interceptor aircraft stood ready to defeat these enemy aircraft, which numbered 310. Among those 310 aircraft were eight Royal Air Force Vulcan B-2 nuclear bombers. A flight of four flew from Scotland, while the other four launched from the British territory of Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. The American plan was to detect these enemy bombers by radar and other early warning systems. And then they would be intercepted and destroyed in simulated attacks by U.S. jet fighters and missile batteries. The attacking bombers split their attacks between high and low altitude. The defending fighters did very well against the stratojets and stratofortresses, intercepting many of them. But the Vulcans proved more elusive opponents. The Vulcan flew at the highest altitude of the simulated Soviet bombers, cruising at 56,000 feet. One was successfully intercepted at this altitude over Goose Bay, Labrador, by a United States Air Force F-101 Voodoo. But the other seven Vulcans all managed to penetrate American airspace to launch simulated bombing attacks on U.S. cities. They then turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. The question was, how had the Vulcan managed it? The answer was their highly advanced electronic countermeasures systems and the Vulcan's amazing maneuverability. For example, the flight of four aircraft that approached from Bermuda were successful because three of them put up a wall of electronic interference that prevented interception, while the fourth Vulcan carried out a simulated nuclear strike. This was all rather embarrassing for Strategic Air Command which quickly buried all stories about British bombers having nuked U.S. targets and confidently assured the American public that U.S. air defenses were, as I said, 99% effective. But they lied. What? So, wow, this isn't good. It's like, clear, I mean, clearly there's weaknesses anywhere, but it's... The way the world's going, it's not going to be that long before one of these aren't simulated anymore. And it's the real deal. How long? How long before that happens, you know? And the, and the United States military is so arrogant in, in thinking that they're the best that it wouldn't happen. You know what I mean? To where almost uh, here in the United States, they probably got a relaxed state thinking there's no way we would have an attack on our soil, which... That's that's when the bad guys get you, you know, when, when you're not thinking about it, right? They catch you off guard and you think that everything's fine. When you think you got it, sometimes you don't got it. Hopefully we got it. Would hate for something to happen, of course. Hopefully nobody wants to nuke us. I know they want to, but hopefully they don't. Hopefully they don't. <laughs> However, the following year, the Americans invited the RAF to take part in Exercise Sky Shield 2. Perhaps the USAF was determined to show that the Vulcan's previous success was only a fluke, a one-time only event. Sky Shield 2, which occurred on the 14th of August 1961, was an even bigger event than the first one. It caused 2,900 US and Canadian flights to be grounded, affecting 125,000 commercial passengers. Jeez. During the exercise, 125 US and British bombers would be pitted against 1,800 fighters and 250 missile sites, and over 200,000 Air Force personnel from the US and Canada. This flies bugging me. Coming up on 16 and a half seconds. Now, continuing. Yeah, but I'm straight for ready. We're ready. Now. Brace up hard here. Come up. Six up, standing by front. Again, eight Vulcan B-2s participated, split again into two flights. 
one attacking on the northern route from RAF Lossiemouth in Scotland via Canada, and the other four aircraft on a southerly route from Kindley Air Force Base Bermuda. The B-47 Stratojets simulated low-level Soviet bombers. The B-52s would attack between 35,000 and 42,000 feet, while the Vulcans mm -hmm. again operated at the highest altitude, 56,000 feet. At the massive NORAD, or North American Air Defense Bunker, at Colorado Springs, the U.S. top brass was joined by the RAF's Air Marshal Sir Kenneth Cross of Bomber Command and Sir Wallace Kyle, chief of the RAF Technical Training Command, to monitor the exercise. Just before 2 p.m., U.S. interceptors pounced on the B-52s, approaching at the mid to high altitude level. The Vulcans also came in from the north, and again, due to the Vulcans' high-tech jamming equipment, only one was shot down by an F-101 Voodoo fighter. Uh -huh. In fact, large numbers of U.S. fighters were scrambled, but they concentrated almost exclusively on the B-52s. When the Vulcans came over, the interceptors did not have sufficient fuel remaining to climb to 56,000 feet plus and engage them. The surviving three Vulcans conducted their attack successfully, turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. Wow. The southern did. attack force of four Vulcans from Bermuda reached a position 50 miles off the U.S. coast before fighters were scrambled to intercept. Again, three of the Vulcans unleashed an electronic jamming screen that kept the attacking F-102 Delta daggers busy while the fourth aircraft crept round to the north and sneaked through. Yes. This Vulcan proceeded to land at Plattsburgh Air Force Base in New York. If this had been a real attack, New York City could have been reduced to a smoking, irradiated hole in the ground. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of scary. Twice they failed. They're just like so arrogant. It makes you wonder what the actual numbers are because they'll tell you nowadays like, oh, we're so efficient. Oh, we, oh we're, we're this good and oh, we're this strong. Are we? I mean, really though, are we? Because you're saying that we're 99% effective in, in stopping these air attacks, whatever, right? But yet the Brits kind of showed you up twice there, you know, so kind of makes you wonder. Many of the Stratojets and Stratofortresses had also managed to evade interception and launch simulated nuclear attacks, but not at the kind of success rate that the Vulcans enjoyed. In two massive exercises of eight Vulcans that attacked on each occasion, seven had got through to their targets, an astounding survival rate against the huge might of the US air defenses. The Vulcans show that with the right aircraft, America could be laid wide open to a nation-ending assault, yeah, something which the Soviet Union would have been very interested in. Yeah. Fortunately for all concerned, the relationship between Britain and the United States never changed from special to decidedly antagonistic, and the Vulcans never came in anger. The American government also tried to make damn sure that nobody ever found out about the Vulcans nuking American cities. The U.S. Air Force was very quick to deny rumors that RAF planes had once again successfully penetrated U.S. airspace. In fact, the U.S. government went so far as to classify all references to Vulcans included in the Sky Shield exercises. After all, if the RAF could practice nuke New York City, Washington, D.C., and even Chicago, the Soviets could do the same, if they could develop an aircraft as good as the Vulcan. As far as Strategic Air Command was concerned, the Vulcan episodes had never happened, and the U.S. was well protected, and that protection, as I said, 99% effective. The Vulcans' successful attacks on America were only fully declassified in 1997. Yeah, and then what? All people have to do is study this stuff. Study the Vulcans, study their capabilities, recreate a, a, a plane like that, or somehow acquire an old Vulcan and reverse engineer it. it. It's not inconceivable to think that some bad people would have some bad ideas with this. It's not good. 
long after the Vulcan had left British service. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share and also visit. All right, so go check out Mark Felton Productions original channel. And uh, wow, so Britain nuked America twice, guys. So the United States military, maybe not quite as powerful as they say, kind of makes you nervous, don't it? Or, or me, at least. I live here. Uh, luckily, I live in the middle of nowhere, not close to any targets, I don't think. So <laughs> hopefully, right? Fingers crossed. You guys have a super fun, awesome day, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care. Bye.